you to sing with us if you know the words. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. was surprised and shocked that we were discussing how mad I was. She looked at me and she says, is this the big end of your anger? I'm like, what? She says, is this the biggest you get angry? And now I'll confess to you, my first thoughts were, uh, no. Have you seen The Incredible Hulk? 
You know who that is? That quiet, unassuming scientist, Bruce Banner, that transforms into this big, raging green monster when he gets angry? That's literally what I thought of immediately. I thought of Bruce Banner who says, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry, and I'm always angry. Instead, I looked at her and I said, I wish I could say this is the biggest I got angry. I wish I could say that this is the biggest end of that. But the most I can say is, thankfully, is I don't get angry often. It takes me lots of, it has taken me lots of years, decades even, working on not getting big angry. Bruce Banner is known for saying, I don't want to control it, I want to get rid of it. Wouldn't it be something if we could all get rid of whatever it is that brings us to that point of big anger? Or even a little anger. And to use yet another banner quote, do we, we believe we have a compelling reason not to lose our cool. I invite you to consider that last question as I read yet another scripture from today's lectionary. It's from Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 25. So then, putting away falsehood, let us all speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God, as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This too is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Over the past 18 to 20 months, depending on when you want to decide, pandemic started for us here in Merced, right? So much has happened. And one of the things that has happened is that it has become very evident that many things in the fabric of society have changed. We've changed our ways of doing things. We've changed our ways of uh, taking care of things. We've take, changed our ways of communicating. We've changed our ways for almost everything under the sun due to the last 18 to 20 months. We're a bit more frayed and ragged. Some would say we're even unraveling as a society. Even the tapestry of this faith community, the faith community, has been a bit looser knit. It's been hard to stay connected to each other in our everyday relationships. Seem to be a bit stressed, not to mention those of our friendships and families seem a little bit less tight as well. I think becoming isolated and distance, potentially infectious or vulnerable, has not helped the situations of relationships. And something that has come very apparent, even as we try to come back together, is that we've become a little less social, much less tolerable, and even less tolerating. I think each of you will understand my next statement then when I say it seems as if our self-protecting, voluntarily isolating, required quarantining, personal pod selecting and sustaining, we've been left to our own devices, merits, wits, wisdom, and lack thereof. We've had to be significantly more self-entertaining, self-aware, self-protecting, self-supported, and self-regulating. How about that? Yeah. It's no wonder then that we've also found ourselves having difficulty being self-regulated. 
Any of us wrestle with our thoughts, our spirits, our emotions this past year? Or our attitudes, actions, or esteem? As a direct result of the struggle, I've heard and seen and experienced moments when I wonder, what happened to us? Seriously, what happened? How do we allow ourselves to go unchecked in so many ways? Add the anonymity and the inheritance buffering cyberspace to the mix of our lives, and we're even more able to be irresponsible, offensive, and otherwise brazenly outspoken and judgmental, offering our polarizing opinions and, yes, our hate. What better way to let people know you're angry, selfish, greedy, mean, and nasty than to just post something online? Pandemic suggested distancing and media buffers seem to have allowed us to be more self-centered and less communal. And although the internet provides connectivity, meaning distance no longer should be an absolute separation, it has ironically also added to being, to that sense of being isolated, disconnected from those who are in our presence or could be in our presence. Have you ever seen a table of all the people at, a, at that table looking at their cell phones? Or everyone in the car on their own device? Or use your own device to call, text, or Alexa drop into someone else in the house instead of going to them personally? Kids doing online studies have struggled not having that social and personal time face to face. The truth is, many adults did as well, do as well. Many have also struggled with the possibility of having too much in-person time with family 24-7, 365. That's difficult with kids, spouses, roommates for 20 months on end, right? And while I can't speak to all results of the pandemic, I did want to touch on something today that's been really heavy on my heart, something that's been pressing, something that I feel like God is just compelling me to speak out about. And it's the seemingly increased licenses for us to say and do that which we think we need to say and or do at any given time, disregarding of the possible filter of love that should come first. Did y'all get that? Irregardless disregarding love and patience and kindness and forgiveness and hospitality and care. Somehow we've lost some expectations of civility, respect, and even self-regulating. I think the increased isolation in our society has, has helped us to become a little bit more apathetic. It has enabled us to simply not care. As if we've lost our social manners, our compassion, our concern for others, and shrunk the personal filters, who needs them anyway? We see proofs of this. We see it on embittered Facebook arguments and on trolling. We see it emboldened in egocentric, egocentric statements. We see it as the political divide and the social issues and the religious issues and the personal attacks on media come over and over again. We see it in the grocery store checkout line, at church, at home. Sometimes it has become so commonplace and almost unex almost expected, leading many to enter a room or a building or a conversation already ready for a fight. With their metaphorical boxing gloves on, even in saying hello. We really don't think we owe anybody anything. We don't owe respect on the internet or courtesy on the highway, consideration for a particularly bad day, and certainly not any kind of real concern or compassion for our neighbor. And so this type of behavior isn't left to just us. And so we see it repeatedly. It's also left to us, not only personally, but collectively. I think we can see it mostly in the way in which we talk to and about others. Ouch, I know, sorry. I really am sorry. 
a tough conversation to have. It's as if we enter into every conversation expecting a battle. We can choose to be offensive or defensive. We use our words as weapons. I have to make my point. I have to be right. We see this often in the comfortable spaces like home where we think we say or do anything because it's my home. They know me. They love us. I think I love them. They can put up with me. It comes into place, play in other places too where we think we're allowed to just be ourselves because we know each other. We've been that way all our lives. That's just the way she is. That's just the way he is. Or we think we're allowed to just be ourselves no matter how offensive, polarizing, or outright ugly that might be. It happens in every place where we disagree and in every place where we come in with our own agendas and we think that those agendas take priority. At home, at work, the checkout line, church, in our neighborhoods. But herein lies our challenge for this day. This scripture, this lectionary reading, the one we just read is a letter to the Ephesians and we're offered a different approach to living our lives in community. We're offered a choice, another option. It insists that we are members of the same body and therefore we have responsibility towards each other. Yes, I do owe you something. It implies that when we speak to one another, we are doing it with love and respect. And it applies the scripture to us in ways that we care for each other. Not just those that we know, but those beyond our circles. And even more than that, Ephesians says that our words should convey, every time we speak, they should convey truth and grace to each other. Truth and grace. I don't think it means a, theori a, a theoretical approach. It's not about a courtroom and inquiry or an academic research or something like that. No, I think it's talking about more like what the prophet Isaiah brought up. Speak the truth to one another. In the courts give real justice, the kind that brings peace. Do not plan ways of harming one another. Do not give false testimony under oath. I hate lying, injustice, and violence. Zechariah is telling us, speaking the truth is a way of fulfilling our commitment to relate to one another in ways that promote peace and justice, in ways that extend grace. When that is the case of our words, they convey that grace, and they become a vehicle and demonstration of the very grace of God. The one we want to imitate, right? In the verses just before today, we were begged, begged to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. It reminded us that there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all was above all and through all and in all and that we were given gifts by that one. That someone would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We're supposed to make it to the full measure and stature of Christ. Any of y'all feel like you're on the road to perfection? I can say I'm on the road. I can say I haven't made it there yet. Speaking the truth in love, growing up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament by which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. That's a lot of work. 
These two texts are strike contrast to the anger and the bitterness and the strife that seems so prevalent in human experience, especially as we go through this pandemic stuff these days. While we may say what's really on our minds when we're angry, that doesn't mean that we're speaking truth. When our words are motivated by anger, it seems that they are much more likely to be rotten words, another reference from Ephesians. And those rotten words, those rotten words aren't simply profanity, it's not just cursing. But it's also that which goes against whatever is good. Rotten words are like rotten fruit. They are the opposite of good. And this good fruit is what should characterize our lives in the body of Christ. While rotten words are harmful and destroy the bond of peace and poison the body of Christ, we're called to offer up good fruit, good words, grace to each other. Too often, rotten words come out of a place of anger. So we're gonna talk about anger for a few seconds. There's anger, and then there's anger. Y'all know that. There's the kind of anger that feels deeply the injustice of oppression, righteous anger. I am angry that there is not enough food for everybody to eat today. That's righteous anger. I'm angry that there is violence in this world. That's righteous anger. I'm angry that not everyone is regarded as equal. That's righteous anger. But then there's another right anger. That anger is that which is more self-serving, right? The one that speaks to our common and, and human experience individually. And that's the kind of anger that if we had a special weapon, we would vaporize someone on the highway if they cut us off if we could. Not me. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it's the kind of anger that refuses to see the humanity in the object of our anger. It's the kind of anger that makes us think we have every right to sit in judgment and pronounce final sentence on another human being. You know the sentiment. Off with their heads. It's the kind of anger that always constitutes a dangerous sin because it destroys relationships. And this is where we get to the grieving spirit. It grieves God when relationships are destroyed. The truth of our existence is that we really are each other's keeper. We are charged to care for one another, charged to love one another, and charged to extend grace to each other. We're truly connected to each other through Christ already. We have an obligation to one another to live in the healthy body of Christ that builds up the body of Christ in a context of mutual faith, in a context of all of us maturing, in the context of all of us working on towards that perfection, in the context of relating to each other with love and kindness and compassion. And when we don't, God is grieved. It grieves our creator when we act in ways that positively destroy the fabric of humanity that the spirit weaves among us it grieves our Creator when we become much more about ourselves than about the ones God has created. It grieves our Creator when we decide to not be righteously angry at all the injustice in this world and the lack of peace. And so, we're given another option. We're given another choice, a choice to be part of that reconciling, renewing work of the Spirit on this earth. A choice to build up humanity, a choice to build up the body of Christ, a choice to build up each other and be built up with each other. Our piece of restoring that relationship with God and the body of Christ is sometimes means we have to deal with our own issues, <laughs> our own anger, our own hate, our own isms, our own self-centeredness. Sometimes it means that we will have to forgive. And sometimes it means we will have to ask forgiveness. I'll be the first to admit that isn't easy. I know I still get angry. 
although I don't go in Incredible Hulk anymore. I've learned not every conversation is an argument, and in the case of every argument, I don't have to attend every argument. I've learned that fighting battles for peace and justice are more noble than fighting for myself. I've learned that there are some things that are right to be angry about. Those things that are for the great, for good. But what that means is when I get in that moment of being uncomfortable, of being in that place of anger, I have to ask myself, is this righteous anger? Is this about me? Am I building up or tearing down? Am I imitating Christ? We're instructed through our text and through the faith to be responsible for our words, our actions, our deeds, to know that there are times that we have offended and times that we are offended. To know that sometimes we offended and make other people angry. And sometimes we ourselves have been offended. It invites us to be a part of that reconciling, redeeming, and recreating work in these instances, offering forgiveness, asking forgiveness turning away from those rotten words, attitudes, and behaviors, partnering with God in those works, we've got to practice kindness. I think that's the word for today, kindness. Kindness and empathy, intentionally being sympathetic towards one another, intentionally forgiving, intentionally trying not to offend asking forgiveness, repenting, and doing it a different way so as not to offend again. This is the way we fulfill our calling to be a sign in and for the world of the new reality which God has made available to people through Jesus Christ. This is how we don't grieve the Spirit, but instead work with the Spirit. That's what we're being called to do today to work with that spirit for the building up of the body of Christ. I wonder, could we all go in from big angry to bigger loving? That's the question. Actually, you know, that's our mandate. Go, love God, love each other, love all, and do it big. In response to this message, I invite you to repeat alternately with me, for we are members of one another. For we are members of one another. Come, let us put away all things that divide us and love one another, for we are members of one another. Come, let us not be divided from one another by gender, race, color, or status, for we are members of one another. Let us put away lies, anger, stealing, and rotten words, for we are members of one another. Come, let us put away bitterness, wrath, clamor, and malice, for we are members of one another. Let us put away uncleanliness, idolatry, and deception, for we are members of one another. Together, instead, let us speak truth, Labor together and do what is good and edifying to the Lord. Let us be imitators of God, for we are members of one another. Let us walk as the children in God and love as Christ first loved us, for we are saints, God's chosen people, and we are members of one another. And feel free to sing with us. Shine, Jesus, shine. Oh, the Lord, 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 the
Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Glaze, Spirit, glaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your world. this week, as you go into the next moments of your life, go out and imitate God, living in love. Put your hope in God's word and let your own words be truthful and constructive. May sin rouse your anger, but never let anger cause you to sin. Don't allow any room for evil. And may God, may God always hear your voice. May Christ raise you to new life. May the Holy Spirit nourish you for the life of love. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and your neighbor, the name of Christ. Amen. Go in peace.